Kristen Vermilia. Welcome to ZFF Daily. Let's take a look and see what happened on the green carpet last night. Thank you for many, many magical movie moments. And I promise you, I'm definitely gonna find the Holy Grail so that you can continue to make movies for us for a very, very long time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. fun here at Tommy Hilfiger. It's great, it's amazing. And I'm enjoying it. I think uh, it's one of the best film festivals that you can go to. I'm here with producer Stacy Scher, who's also on the International Feature Jury here at the Zurich Film Festival. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Well, I'm very fancy because tonight's the big night. You are very fancy. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you just off the, back of, off the bat about um, women in Hollywood. And do you feel like it's easier for women now than when you started or more difficult or just different? I think it's just different, really. It's very complicated. When I started... Um, it, it was very apparent when you were dealing with sexism, and now I think it's trickier, you know? I think that it hides. So while there are still a tremendous number of female studio heads, wildly successful, there still is a kind of subtle sense of sexism everywhere in the world. I, I loved Sheryl Sandberg's book. I got a chance to get to know Sheryl a little bit, and. It explained more about my career to me than almost anything I I'd, wow. I'd read. Interesting, and that the one of the points that she brings up is that especially with our girls, that when you have like bossy little girls, or that they're leaders, right? And to talk yes. to them that they're leaders, they're no one calls little boys bossy. That's they right. only call little girls bossy. They yeah. if boys exhibit those skills, they say that they are leaders, That's right. and they give strong orders. Uh, and little girls are called bossy. Yes. We have lots of leaders around. I have a little leader at home. <laughs> I have a not so little leader. Um, so we had a chance to uh, take a look at your master class. You you uh, had a master class here at the Zurich yes. Film Festival. So let's take a look at Stacy's class. Stacy Sher. She's one of the most significant and famous producers in America, and has already worked on a lot of famous productions. I think we just need to remind ourselves of some of the productions she's worked on. Things like. Django Unchanged, LOL, Contagion, Extraordinary Measures, Garden State, Along Came Polly, Aaron Brockovich, Man on the Moon, Out of Sight, Gattaca, Get Shorty, Pulp Fiction, Reality Bites, The Fisher King, just to name but a few. Wow. Um, I think what he means is I'm old. <laughs> At the last ZFF Masterclass, she talked to professionals about her job as a producer. But what does a producer actually do? You're a little bit like um, the container. So let's say the idea is the water, right? So it's my job to hold this container, remind everybody that what's in it, the water's precious, not let it spill out, or if it does, replenish it. And what is it that made her so successful? It was a combination of something that's just a gift, which is the material that I'm drawn to. But I, I think the thing that I can share with everybody is to read a lot of scripts and see great movies and really understand, you know, put in, um, put in the hours to study great cinema from every golden age of cinema. Finally, some advice for anybody wanting to get into film producing. I feel very blessed to get to do something that I love every day. And I always say to people, if there's anything else that you can imagine doing, that you would be as happy doing, you should do that, because this is hard. Some great advice. I heard great okay, things yeah. about the class. Sorry, I missed it. How do you find new voices and new stories? You know, you just dig. You, um, 
you just tend to read and read and read, pay attention to what you're hearing. I find that for brand new filmmakers, a lot of times, actors' agents will hear about them first because the scripts go to the actors' agents to try and raise money in the international community. And there are certain, as we know, there are certain actors who mean more internationally, and that's part of how you fundraise. So the actor agents are always the first people to read the brand new scripts. And I think international filmmaking has been the place where a lot of new, exciting directors are breaking. Um, I remember seeing, and I know he was on the jury last year, Snobacash, Daniel Espinosa's film, and saying this is the debut of a major voice, or um, the Italians, or it, there are pockets everywhere. The Mexicans, there's been, there have been a lot coming out of Sweden, mm -hmm. like Daniel. Um, so world cinema, French directors, world cinema has been very exciting. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I wanted to talk to you too. Something I found really interesting was the whole Kickstarter campaign thing. Um, I'm sure people have asked you a lot about this, and, and I think part of the the um, so so it was a record breaking, you know, like what two million in four days or something, and then it went up from there. Yeah. And it was for Zach Braff's new movie that you're working on with him, and a lot of the the the, the backlash was that established producers and directors shouldn't be using this platform to raise money, but I feel like it's about building a community, isn't it? Can you talk about that a little I, bit? I think it's a lot. Um, the Kickstarter experience was extraordinary. Mm. I think that really what happened was we were completely shocked that it was impossible to raise money for his film after his first film, Garden State, was a hit. Such a great film. Yeah. A wonderful mm. film. Uh, his play had been a, a huge success both in the United States when it played off-Broadway and when it played in London. Mm -hmm. Sold out for weeks. And we kind of couldn't believe that people didn't trust his voice and his vision. Right. So we were offered a horrible deal to make a film that was entirely set in California in Vancouver. And they mm -hmm. said, just roll around a few palm trees and pots and pretend that you're in Los Angeles. And really, the script he'd written was a love letter to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And they wanted us, for foreign sales, to cast a huge star in every teeny tiny role, mm -hmm. which was not going to be easy to make happen. Right. We had a short period of time, because now he's um, in rehearsals for Woody Allen's first musical that he's the lead in. And we knew we needed the summer for the children, because it stars children as well. And I said to him, it's just as much of a risk to try and get a giant movie star in every single part as it is to turn to your community and your fans who are very connected to you. Um, my husband had shown me there's a musician named Amanda Palmer. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah, know her. Yeah. So Amanda Palmer last year went out to the commu her community of fans right. asking for $100,000 to promote her record. Right. 30 days later, she had raised $1.1 million. Right. People want to be a part of something that the people that work they love are, are creating. So we went out there. We were very prepared for it to get rough. And the only people really who criticized us were journalists and filmmakers who were less successful than Zach, right. who resented it. And in fact, Yancey Strickler, the um, co-founder and CEO of Kickstarter, said that we have, and Veronica Mars, and now Spike Lee, have all brought so many more people to the platform of Kickstarter who are now financing other projects. I, I had backed Kickstarter projects before, and I had also backed um, objects, you know, recycled picture frames or uh, wa uh, sustainable water bottles or any great ideas that you can back internationally on Kickstarter. Right. And we were knocked out by our community of 47,000 people who gave us $3.1 million and made it possible for us to make our film. It's an amazing story. And I do think it, I mean, it only helps. I mean, there's not a limited amount of funds. It really does raise the awareness of this fantastic thing and help other independent filmmakers, I think. Well, our backers who had never been on Kickstarter before, Zach's fans mm -hmm. and the people who loved Garden State and the people who loved Scrubs said, it, it was exciting for them. It was like, I remember when, um, when eBay started and I was looking for these strange glasses that were juice glasses with Archie and Veronica on them, some crazy thing. And I ended up buying like, 
when I found out that there were about 150 of them, I stopped collecting them. But it's that sort of a new community, you know, and it's exciting. I backed Spike Lee. Um, I backed some television shows. I've backed uh, water bottles, picture frames, uh, different things, you know, all different kinds of documentaries. And it's fun. It's fun to get the updates. I love getting Spike Lee's lists of the movies that influenced him or, you know, and, and we have really worked hard to make sure that our updates are explaining things to our community and, and they're, they're really excited. It is. Well, it's, it's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank I you. love the whole idea. Um, well, one nightmare for any producer would be to have your star or one of the, the actors in your film pass away while you are shooting. And um, we have a segment talking about um, some solutions that people have found to that problem. There are not many movies in which actors have died during production. One tragic example is Brandon Lee in The Crow. He was fatally hit by a rogue piece of metal during a shootout scene. The movie was finished with what was, for 1994, cutting-edge digital technology. Another example is Heath Ledger's part in Terry Gilliam's The Imaginarium of Dr. Panassus. During production, Heath Ledger died of an overdose in his hotel room. After rewriting the screenplay, Gilliam replaced Ledger with three actors, Johnny Depp, Jude Law, and Colin Farrell. The German film The Invention of Love faced the same problem. Actor Maria Kwiatkowski died during production. We met her fellow actor in the film, Sunyi Meles, who told us how she first reacted when she heard that Kwiatkowski had passed away. I was so touched as a person, as how she was acting. So she died and we were standing on the set. And Lola Randl, it's her second film only, and she wrote a screenplay and she directed. And so we were waiting what happened. And then she's had the de decision to say, we are the actor and we react as an actress. So it, it needs a kind of art that you have this comfort to survive those, this film. With a rewritten script and a new actress for the leading role, one year after the death of Kwiatkowski, filming continued. And when I saw the other Marie, and she was playing Maria, I was crying because I saw her with her clothes, but it was another person. The movie embodies the tragedy of death, life and love and is a sort of memorial to Maria Kwiatkowski. I always want to have like a fairy tale, a happy end, but it isn't. So, but this is a, it's also art to say, is the film the film? After four years in production, The Invention of Love resolved its lead actress's absence with a film within a film. The Invention of Love serves as an example of an uncommon way to handle real death and love. Hello. Emily, liebste, jetzt komm wieder zurück. Sorry. Pass out. Stacey, do you think the internet is changing how we tell stories? I think the internet is making certain things more available. I think that the short documentary and the short film have become more available, but I think that what, what we're seeing is there have been great films. There have also, there, in America, there's been phenomenal television. And just five years ago, people were saying TV was dead. And, or maybe even a little bit more. And we've seen the greatest resurgence in storytelling on television. So I think any form that new voices can break um, or you can reach people, I, I think that no matter how anybody feels about what the, um, the imaginary children people were doing at, and with Coney 2012, they got people interested in documentary filmmaking. Right. 
I think that Netflix has made foreign films, foreign language films, documentaries, all of those things far more available to people. Mm. So the audience is growing. And I think that's a way in which the internet has changed for sure what's accessible. When I was growing up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I couldn't see the work of Fellini. I couldn't see the work of Pasolini. I couldn't mm. see, you know, I had to wait until they came out on Criterion Collection. And even that was later because they're, they're, I, I had laser discs. Right. You know, so, um, so I think that, I, I think we can sit and say, you know, oh, the good old days, or we can embrace technology and embrace change, because I think change is always exciting. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, what's next for you? What are you working on? Well, uh, Zach's Films in post-production. Great. And we have made a, a television deal with AMC, the people who made Breaking Bad and Mad Men. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to focus on some television. Um, also, uh, many years ago, I produced a film called Reality Bites that was Ben Stiller's directorial debut. Right. And Ben and Helen Childress, the writer of the screenplay, and I are doing, developing a series for NBC. Wow, that's of exciting. Reality Bites, which has been fun. So we've been doing a lot of TV. I'm still... Uh, developing screenplay for Devil in the White City, which has now been on the New York Times bestseller list for 10 years. Wow. About the Chicago World's Fair. Wow. And America's first serial killer. We're producing it with Leonardo DiCaprio, um, wor working on the script, and just doing a whole bunch of just back in there developing everything. And, and oh, how could I forget? Um, we just finished Scott Frank's um, adaptation of A Walk Among the Tombstones that he also directed with Liam Neeson. Wow. And we just finished Zach Braff's film with Zach and, and Kate Hudson. That's a lot. <laughs> and, and your partner, Michael Schamberg, was here at the festival he last year. He was indeed. He's lovely. He's with wonderful. With his matching socks and, and glasses. And <laughs> he was, That's he was his great. thing. Yeah, that is his thing. So it's really very nice to have met you and so, so glad you came to in to, to speak with us. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having You're me. You're welcome. One of the other exciting things that's been happening here this year at the Zurich Film Festival is we have a segment called ZFF for Kids. Let's take a look at this. For the first time, ZFF had a special program for its younger audience, ZFF for Kids. The films were screened in their original languages and translated live. The initiator of ZFF for Kids, Christine von Frankstein, explains why. Uns ist es wichtig, dass die Kinder, wenn sie schon die fremden Kulturen und die neuen Erlebniswelten kennenlernen wollen, dass sie die Filme wirklich im Original wahrnehmen können, dass sie die Originalsprache hören eines indonesischen Jungen auf dem Dorf und das nicht auf Deutsch hören. Sie hören das quasi in einer zweiten Ebene wie ein Flüsterton im Saal. She invented this section of the ZFF out of a passion for children's cinema. Wenn Kinder ins Kino gehen, ist es ein ganz besonderer Moment, weil sie können Helden finden, mit denen sie sich identifizieren können. Das können auch manchmal Verlierer sein, die dann plötzlich doch zu Helden werden am Ende. Among the movies being shown is a Swiss production, The Black Brothers, directed by Oscar winner Xavier Koller. The movie celebrated its world premiere at the Arena Cinemas on Sunday. We met Koller following the screening. Man hat ja immer die Bedenken, ob alles richtig läuft und so, und man hört, und jedes Kino ist anders, es tönt anders, aber die Leute waren offenbar, das habe ich festgestellt, sehr konzentriert und es hat ihnen gefallen, das ist die Hauptsache. Along with stars like Moritz Bleibtreu and Leonardo Negro, Koller cast new young actors. How was working with the teenage stars? Das war super. Die waren, waren sehr motiviert, manchmal äh, nicht so konzentriert, wie das halt unter, unter diesen Teenagern ist. Die hatten andere Sachen im Kopf und da mussten wir die ein bisschen, zu, äh, ein bisschen schütteln, damit sie wieder alle wach sind und so. Aber äh, es hat sehr wenig Spaß gemacht. The film takes place in Ticino. It's about a boy named Giorgio. He's forced to climb through dark chimney stacks, removing soot with his bare hands. Giorgio joins forces with other chimney sweeps to found the union of the Black Brothers. Together they fight their misery and dare to escape back home. 
We asked the young star how he felt after the premiere. Es war echt spannend, weil ähm, man, ich das noch überhaupt nicht gewohnt war, mich so in der Größe zu sehen und vor allem vor so vielen Leuten irgendwie. Und es war ja auch für mich das erste Mal, dass ich den Film überhaupt gesehen habe, sprich auch nochmal irgendwie besonders, weil ich noch gar nicht wusste, so wie sieht es dann aus. Here fans are waiting in line to see the star from the Dutch film Nono het Zigzag Kind, Burghard Klausner. Ich fand es klasse, die haben es natürlich wie jedes Publikum sich am Anfang nicht getraut, auch selber Fragen zu stellen. Aber wenn dann der Damm mal gebrochen ist, dann äh, sprudelten die nur geradezu vor, vor Fragen und waren ganz süß. Und äh, denen hat es, glaube ich, auch <lacht> ziemlich gut gefallen. Herr Feinberg. Was ist unsere Mission eigentlich? Ich dachte, dass ihr ein Junge mit viel Fantasie warst. Von da ist alles möglich. Von da? Ben jij de inspecteur? Ik weet dat onze missie gaat worden. Well, that's it for us today on ZFF Daily. Join us again tomorrow for our very last show. We will be joined in the studio by Zurich Film Festival co-director Nadia Schilknecht. So we'll see you here tomorrow. Have a good day.